Hello everybody. As Mathieu will be talking about the Caisse Centrale de la France Libre, I thought it was a good idea to speak to you all about another aspect of the Free French story. For those of you who may not be too familiar with this term, this group was founded in London by General Charles de Gaulle in June 1940. They represent the external part of the French resistance and were greatly helped by the British government, in a similar manner as to other governments in exile. However, the Free French were not the official government of France. Those who held the reins of French power, if one can call it that, were in Vichy, under the control of de Gaulle's former commanding officer, Philippe Pétain. What I find most interesting about the Free French is that they were not considered as a government in exile, yet they were permitted to raise troops and run colonial economies with the full cognizance of the British government. Effectively, their positive collaboration, to reappropriate the term from negativity, begs many questions as to the relations of state and non-state actors, economic resistance and clandestine financing. I have decided to talk about the French delegations who contributed funds to the Free French movement from abroad, in countries who were not directly implicated in the fighting. These included many nations in South and Central America, including Mexico, Argentina, Uruguay and Chile. My work has evaluated the important financial role that these groups played in the financing of the movement. It also takes the opportunity to reinstate those who are most often forgotten from national war stories of war expatriates and other francophile non-citizens. While one may leave one's country of origins, it takes far longer for one's countries of origins to take leave of your personality. Clearly, I'm speaking from personal experience here, but the actions and support of free French delegations demonstrate that such behaviour isn't isolated, nor is it simply anecdotic. The financing of the Free French was a worldwide undertaking. The funds that were sent to London were destined for a number of different uses, to pay for troops, equipment and to buy support through the use of propaganda, for instance. The foreign committees were an important vector for raising funds for the French internal and external resistance movements. Donations increased by 22.5% from 1941 into 1942. The Free French were backed primarily by the Bank of England. With global diffusion of Free French propaganda, they organically grew a following and a support base. These supporters were ready to help de Gaulle and his forces through two principal means, volunteering and payments. Volunteering involved either travelling to London and joining the movement directly, or performing a role on a delegation in their country of residence. Payments took many forms, including subscribing to the foreign committees and directly sending donations to the Free French. Through money donated independently, the Free French were able to operate autonomously to a greater degree. While South American countries sent a great proportion of the funds received by the Free French, the Free French Committee in Australia was one of the richest. This is underlined by the country's status as one of the main supply links for the Free French territories of New Caledonia and Tahiti. The membership numbers of those belonging to the Australian Free French Committee, however, remained limited. In January 1942, there were 1,408 members, of whom 1,090 were non-French, meaning that there were 318 French citizens in the group. 
The historian Tyva Rowe attributes this to the fact that the French in Australia were reticent to follow General de Gaulle. The community was made up of diplomats, wool producers, importers and shipping personnel, and only numbered 530 French-born nationals. Using these figures, 60% of the French population of Australia thus belonged to the committee. De Gaulle's representative, Down Under, was named André Brenac, a 38-year-old businessman. Brenac also served as the chairman of the Free French Committee. Born in Mazamé, Languedoc, in 1902, he had been in Australia since the age of 25. In March 1941, he was elected, alongside four other people, including Albert Sordin, the newspaper editor at Le Courrier Australien, which was a well-read joint francophone and anglophone publication. As membership fees were five shillings per year, according to the historian Barrett, the association's subscriptions would have totaled £352, collected using the membership figures from January 1942. On the 31st of January 1942, the balance was £3,739, and at the end of February, £6,805. Thus, it is evident that the majority of the committee's money came from other sources, other than subscriptions. It is not clear whether the revenues of Le Courrier Australien were included in their monthly statement, but this may explain the discrepancy. Nonetheless, they donated practically all of their finances to de Gaulle, even exceeding their own bank balance in 1942. Yet the source of their revenues was never really questioned. Much of the money came from the organisation of balls and parties, including a victory ball that took place in Horsham, New South Wales. Costing six shillings to attend, and included also the provision of supper. The ticket suggests that the ball was in aid of the food and clothing for children of France appeal, meaning that any profits from this event may have been diverted into the account of the Free French Refugee Services in London. Balls, theatre pieces, musical concerts, all were organised as a means of raising extra funds for the Gaullist movement. According to Donahue, the Ligue Franco-Australienne de Secours was able to raise £4,563 in December 1940 to assist in paying for tanks and aeroplanes for the movement. A new round of fundraising between 1940, uh, November 1940 and March 1941, led by Le Courrier Australien, succeeded in obtaining a further £813. When it is considered that an aspirant, or the equivalent of an officer cadet or midshipman, earned about £268 per year, the £813 that was raised between November 1940 and March 1941 would have paid the salary of three aspirants in one year. Donahue estimated that this would have uh, paid for about 18 people, using the average annual Australian salary of 1940, which was £429, as was cited by Atkinson and Lee. However, this is significantly higher than the wages paid to the majority of the Free French Forces officer class, and was more commensurate to the salaries paid to lieutenant colonels and colonels, who earned £775 and £939 per annum, respectively. Importantly, this shows that much of the revenue upon which the Free French Movement relied stemmed from these type of community organisation and charitable actions of concerned French people and francophones. Showing on the screen is a table showing the 10 highest uh, donating Free French Committees in 1941 and 1942. The coloured line shows the respective total, 
in proportion to the other committees. The Argentinian committee were the most generous with their donations, sending slightly more than £37,000 over two years, or 28.4% of the total donations contributed by all of the committees. Using a metric of comparing military salary and donations, this would effectively translate into an annual payment for 39 colonels, 48 lieutenant colonels, or 139 aspirants. These, however, have been rounded down so as to avoid the possibility of half colonel salaries, quarter lieutenant colonel's wages, or thirds of an aspirant's pay. Such a calculation offers a direct comparison between the donations and their real-world usage. However, the pay that was awarded to Free French personnel was already being covered by the British governmental credit. This also included the Czechoslovakian officers who were serving under de Gaulle. Australia appeared six in the list of committees that uh, donated the most, from a group of 35 pro-free French entities. Overall, their gifts made up 5.4% of the donations given in 1941 and 1942. Furthermore, Brenac's Australian committee was the most generous of those within English-speaking countries. The most striking thing about this table is the prevalence of Latin American Hispanophone countries and the effectiveness of those who managed these committees. This was best exemplified by Jacques Soustel, who was a highly trained and experienced ethnographer. Upon mobilisation in 1940, Soustel was sent to be assistant to the military attaché in Mexico. Having been a researcher who had spent a considerable amount of time in South America, Soustel was quickly awarded positions of responsibility, with duties that revolved around the coordination of efforts by the Free French Committees in South and Central America. He was personally responsible for the committee in Mexico and had oversight over the Puerto Rican Committee. In his position as a centralising agent, Soustel was politically competent and capable of managing the competing demands that were placed upon him. These included organising events in one country while keeping abreast of issues in another. The most important factors behind the charitable success of the committees seems to be heavily linked to the size of the country and the effectiveness of the local francophone press. However, there is such a large discrepancy between Argentina, ahead by 16.9%, and Mexico, in second place, that it seems more apt instead to talk of the Argentinian specificity. This was, in large part, linked to the long-standing ties that the French had with Argentina. The French community in this country of Argentina was the largest in South America. However, the number of French citizens in Argentina had been progressively falling since the end of the 19th century. By 1942, it was approximately 49,000. Buenos Aires had long fascinated French travellers, including such eminent people as Georges Clemenceau, Le Tigre, who reflected positively on the, on the city. Equally, the importance of the French language was ever-present, with a large Hachette French language bookshop having been opened in the city. The Free French Committee in the country was initially referred to as the de Gaulle Committee. This reflects heavily upon the movement and could lead to one thinking of a cult of personality. In my view, this is a correct interpretation, but it remains an understandable choice. The movement existed thanks to British support, but de Gaulle was the figurehead. It was he who appeared on the airwaves on 18th of June 1940 and in the newspapers shortly thereafter. However, in order to grow a support base, his role allowed potential supporters to identify the abstract idea of fighting for France with a person. 
It echoes the role of Uncle Sam for the United States, or Kitchener for the British. Various aspects of de Gaulle's character and personality were reflected in those who rallied to him. Often they included former members of the military. Such was the case for Albert Guerin, a veteran of the Great War, who became the president of the de Gaulle Committee in Argentina. However, his leftist political ideals put him at odds with many of the expatriates in Argentina. With a membership of around 4,000 people, according to the historian Carmen Pelosi, each of whom paid subscriptions, it is understandable as to why their donations to the Free French were indeed so sizable. These donations were actively solicited by General de Gaulle, who wrote to Guerin in September 1940, indicating, and I quote, the essential need for the Free French forces to receive funds quickly, end quote. Such requests were responded to, with later documents indicating that £2,000 of Argentinian money was received in London. This is at odds with the methods employed by state. We have already seen much concerning the sale of bonds to private individuals, this was employed in order to avoid resorting to higher taxes. However, the Free French were soliciting money from private individuals through a multitude of different fundraising methods. Elsewhere in my thesis, there is information concerning the contracting of credit by de Gaulle, but this is done on a personal level of de Gaulle, the individual, and not as a representative of a state. What this is showing is that the Free French were operating in a sort of halfway house, somewhere between something approximating a private militia and a fully-fledged empire in exile. So, what have we seen? Well, firstly, it has been shown that the Free French had separate delegations in countries that fell far outside metropolitan France and their empire. Secondly, these delegations provided an important source of both men and money for the Free French movement. Thirdly, it has been shown that Argentina was the country that contributed the most towards this financial drive, and that Australia was the largest delegation in the English-speaking world. While it has long been known that French resistance was assisted from London, this work forces us to completely reevaluate the transnationality of French resistance and to recognise the role played by Francophone and Francophile communities around the world. It also underlines the truly global nature and the effect of the military events that were taking place in Europe. If nothing else, this work underlines the impact that national tragedies can have on their expatriated communities. Viva la resistencia, indeed. Should you wish to read more about the South American delegations, I will be releasing the thesis in book form through Palgrave Macmillan in their series on economic history. It should be out in 2022. Thanks for listening, everybody.